um, and we'll just let Evan um, introduce the operator lifecycle now. All right, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I am Evan Cordell. I am an engineer at Red Hat on the Operator Lifecycle Manager team. Um, and so I wanted to um, sort of go over some of the philosophy and, and architecture and implementation and then do a demo of OLM uh, because we, we do get a lot of questions about it. What is it? Why do I want it? Um, how does it work? Um, and I don't think we've really put together anything for public consumption that sort of lays it all out there for you very well. Um, so I'm going to start right at the basics. Uh, but I'll go through quickly. Um, so I know we're in the operator six, so everyone has an idea of what an operator is already. Um, but for us, for operator lifecycle manager, we really think of an operator as a Kubernetes application, uh, a Kubernetes native application, I should say. And by that, I just mean uh, that it's an, oper uh, an application whose interface is the Kubernetes API. Um, and so all of the assumptions around OLM are, are all around this idea that you are interacting with an application via the Kubernetes API um, and, and orchestrating one via the Kubernetes API. Um, I was going to put a picture of Jack Sparrow, but I wasn't so sure about uh, the copyright issues there. Um, but so like we all have this idea of an operator that said control loops, so watch CRDs, and that's all well and good. Um, and you need those things, uh, but as far as we're concerned, that's all implementation detail of this concept of extending the Kubernetes API. And if Kubernetes comes out with better tools for doing that in the future, we'll still keep up with those in the same, same exact way. Uh, so we know what an operator is. What is operator lifecycle? Um, well, I'm going to propose this definition that an, the operator lifecycle is the definition or specification, the installation, the resolution, by which I mean dependency resolution, um, the upgrading and the automated upgrading, and then the removal of operators. Uh, so these are all the responsibilities uh, of the operator lifecycle manager are, are defining and managing these different aspects of an operator uh, over its lifetime in a cluster. Uh, so what are some of the goals of the operator lifecycle manager? This is what we're trying to provide with the piece of software called OLM. Uh, we want to give you an app store-like experience for discovering and installing operators. Uh, so what's available to you and, and what will work when you run it on your cluster. And then also simplifying the installation of an operator uh, down to just a single kubectl apply or a single uh, click in a user interface. Um, the other aspect is automated upgrades. Um, this is some philosophy that we've uh, carried over from ProOS, Container Linux, uh, Tectonic. Um, we want to but we, we know that there is value in updating things automatically uh, because we can ship out um, fixes to any problems as soon as we know about them. Um, so we want to bring that philosophy into operators as well. Um, another aspect which probably doesn't get a lot of light is uh, that operator lifecycle is designed to be a framework for building rich and reusable user interfaces. And this is both, again, through the CLI and through the UI. Um, and I'll go into some of the details of how we do that later. Um, and then. Uh, package management and dependency resolution of operators. Um, ideally, when you're writing your own operator, you don't need to vendor in 15 other operators just to get yours up and running. Um, we have lessons around how dependency resolution can work from other ecosystems, and we want to take those lessons and apply them to operators as well. Um, so that's some of the philosophy why we're doing this, what we're trying to get out of it. Um, let's go over the actual architecture. Um, at a high level right now, OLM is defined by two separate operators. Um, we call them an OLM and a catalog operator. That's not terribly important. Uh, what you need to know is that one of them manages this object called the cluster service version. Um, and that's essentially our, uh, our package manifest for an operator. And the other uh, operator, the catalog operator, manages uh, these objects that we call catalog sources, which have uh, virtual objects of packages, and then subscriptions and install plans as well. I'll go into exactly what each of those is, but um, I wanted to emphasize that we have a layered architecture where one thing has very specific responsibilities, which is just the cluster service version, and then another operator has a different set of responsibilities and overlays those on top of the other. Um, so what is a cluster service version? This is our uh, specification file for what an operator is and how it should run. It is 100% analogous to uh, something like a dpackage definition or an RPM if you're talking about operating system uh, dependency, manage dependency management. Uh, 
Uh, it's also perfectly analogous to uh, setup.py if you have a Python project, uh, or a brew formula if you're using homebrew for uh, the Mac. Uh, it, it's the definition of met metadata about how to install and run and orchestrate a uh, piece of software on the underlying system. Um, specifically, we have a set of um, like textual metadata, things like description, um, who created it, where did it come from, how do you get support. Um, that's fairly common among package managers. Uh, but specifically for Kubernetes, what, we, what do we need to define an operator? Uh, we have specifically a deployment spec, could be a set of deployment specs, um, but these are literally defining the pods and deployments that will be running the operator software itself. Um, and then aside from that, the only information we really need to know is the CRDs, because the CRDs uh, define that interface for the operator in Kubernetes. Um, so we say that each operator can declare that it owns a set of CRDs. These are the ones, and this is essentially an operator declaring that uh, to the OLM framework that uh, it will be responsible for the life cycle of particular CRDs. And then there's a set of required CRDs, and this is a list of uh, CRDs, not that the cluster service version will own, but that the operator will uh, interact with in some other way. Um, the rest of our dependency management is uh, hung off of these two concepts of owned and required CRDs, because CRDs are the interfaces. Um, for each of these things, we have what we call descriptors, uh, which are essentially indexes into the CRDs. Uh, it's somewhat similar to uh, some of the newer features in Kube, like the, uh, uh, what do they call them, the additional printer columns in CRDs, uh, where you, you go into an object and you give some additional metadata about that. Um, so this is how, we drive some of our UI, and this is how we drive some of the uh, CLI interaction as well. Um, so the OLM operator is responsible for, within every namespace, managing uh, the set of cluster service versions that exist. Um, so for the most part, those will be independent operators, but I wanted to call it what happens when you uh, are in the, in the uh, upgrading state for an operator. Uh, in which you have two cluster service versions that define the same operator, but at different versions. Um, some of the metadata that we collect for operators is which one it replaces. So this gives us a, uh, a, a chain back to an older version of an operator. And then um, OLM manages the lifecycle of those two operators during the upgrade process. Uh, so it either patches or uh, force replaces the deployment and um, migrates resources to the new version, and then GC is the old version. Uh, so that's essentially the only responsibility of the OLM operator. The other operator, which we call the catalog operator, um, which has nothing to do with service catalog, uh, is responsible for these other resources. Uh, the primary one is the install plan. And the install plan, um, similar to our analogy for cluster service versions, the install plan is analogous to using YUM or apt for uh, orchestrating packages on an operating system or PIP for uh, using if you're using Python with a setup.py file. Um, I also wanted to call out that the install plan is also analogous to various lock files that you find from various ecosystems um, because it takes a high-level desired user state and translates that into a uh, ideally immutable set of references that we can apply to other namespaces and get the exact same set of things installed. Um, so an install plan, like I said, has an input that's essentially just the desired CSVs. Um, you can have multiple install plans for a namespace, um, or you can have multiple CSVs defined in an install plan. Um, this triggers the operator to go and find uh, whatever CSVs and CRDs it knows about uh, whatever definitions it has. So these are not things that are installed in the cluster yet. Um, and then it writes out the definitions of those into the status block of the install plan. And then another control loop waits for install plans to be completely resolved and then applies those resources into the cluster. Uh, so where does an install plan find the CSVs and CRDs? Uh, we have a set of objects called catalog sources that define what CSVs and CRDs are, are known. Um, and then organizes those CSVs and CRDs into packages and channels, uh, which is just an organization mechanism for saying, for example, these 50 um, CSVs all are installing the etcd operator, so we'll call that the etcd package, and then within that set of 50, here's a chain of 20 of them that are the alpha channel, the, or the beta channel. Uh, 
Um, so this is just a way to collect and organize all of the definitions of things that are available to a user to install. Um, and then once we have those two things, we have an additional uh, object called a subscription, and subscriptions uh, signal to the operator to check a catalog source frequently for updates, and then whenever an update occurs, to create a new install plan for that object. So this is our full uh, sort of graph of objects. Um, if you're subscribed to a package, for example, etcd, um, you specify a package in a channel, um, that points to a catalog source. So our operator goes and looks uh, for, at the catalog source for any updates. Whenever it finds an update, it creates an install plan with the new versions of the CSVs defined. Um, we have another controller looking for new install plans. It sees that there's a new install plan with a new desired CSV. It resolves that from any of the catalog sources that it needs to talk to and writes those back into the status of the install plan. Then we uh, take those resolved CSVs and CODs and actually apply them to the cluster. And once that point is done, everything else is handled by the OLM operator. So there will be a giant set of cluster service versions in a namespace. Some of those might be new, some of those might be uh, removed, some of them might be upgrading from old versions. And the OLM operator handles all those migrations for you and also creates the CRDs themselves. Um, so you end up with a, a state in your namespace where you have all your CRDs defined. Um, these are all of the new APIs and interfaces that you can use uh, via KubeCuddle or the CI. So now I'm gonna flip over to a live demo of this. Um, I have a namespace. Uh, this is an OpenShift uh, 311 cluster. Um, I have two, I, I have one catalog source right now, and it has two, uh, two packages defined. Um, we happen to have just one channel at the moment. When I create a subscription, uh, I am generating a subscription for the etcd package from a particular catalog source and then telling it to track a particular channel. Create that. Um, we have a UI for it, but it has actually created an install plan in the back. The install plan was created by the operator because of my subscription. Um, in this case, it did automatic approval, so um, the install plan is immediately applied. We also have manual approval, which requires a user with um, right access to go in and manually approve an install plan before it creates. And then um, we specify the specific cluster service version that we want. And then in the status block, it actually goes and puts the definitions that will eventually be applied. Um, in the UI, you can go and see that, um, in this case, this particular cluster already had these particular etcd API versions installed as CRUs. And then the one thing that wasn't existing in the namespace was the actual uh, CSV, and so that was created for us. So if I go back to the operator page, I can see that this is representing the etcd CSV installed, and I can go look at the uh, YAML for that. Um, and so the etcd defines a set of own custom resource definitions. Um, the etcd one does not require any other, so it's, it doesn't depend on anything else, uh, but it does describe the CODs that it uses. So for example, here is a spec descriptor. So these are the descriptors that we use to drive the UI. This says that if you go into an etcd cluster object and you look at the spec.size path, um, you can expect it to be of this particular type. And this particular type is, for us, a pod count object. Um, it has a description here, but we can go into, uh, I can go and create an etcd cluster. And once I do that, um, I am driving the UI. This is generated based on that descriptor. Um, so this is saying that the size is a pod count, and so I know the UI has this widget that shows me I can edit a pod count um, for, for a cluster size. And I can increase the size to five pods, and that gets translated back into the YAML on the back end. Um, so this gives me a way to organize uh, resources and then um, have insight into what's actually happening in my cluster while also giving me that abstraction layer of here's an etcd cluster object. Um, Behind the scenes, it ended up creating you know these pods, 
um, it should be spinning up a, there we go, a fourth and a fifth um, as it's uh, adjusting to my cluster size of five. Um, but we know that these are the objects that it's creating based on the etcd cluster. And if I go in and I delete uh, the etcd cluster uh, myself, it will eventually uh, GC all of the related resources for me. So that's what the, uh, when Sean was talking about the owner reference, that's, we relied pretty heavily on that. Um, I think I've probably gone way over time. So that is my general overview of OLM. Um, I apologize that it was relatively rushed, but I hope that uh, I can help with any questions. Well, that was a really good and quick um, overview. Uh, if there's some questions, uh, that would be great. Um, and if not, um, you can ask them in the chat while we're setting up for the next topic. Um, but yeah, that, that was really well done. And, and also ask questions on the, the Google group as well. Hey, Evan, uh, can you describe the workflow of just an end user that needs to interact with this? I just want to get a, um, a, an NCD database, a Mongo database, a Redis database in my namespace, um, how that all so, kind of works. The ideal scenario is that there's some like persona split between an administrator and a user. And so the administrator would go and set up namespaces with the operators installed for you. And then as a user, you just go in and you'll see um, you'll have our back access to create an SCD cluster, and you just go in and create one, and that's that's all the interaction you have to deal with. Um, so it's up to the administrators to set up, you know, things like subscription policy, whether or not a particular namespace should be updating constantly or not. That kind of thing. gotcha. And I guess that's one thing that uh, you didn't cover in your presentation is there is like a, an idea of access control built into this using yeah. just this R back. But if you can create CSV from those other objects, then that's how you manage this. Correct. Yeah. So that yeah, part of the driving um, ideas behind having everything just be the Kube API is that we get the R back for free, basically, and we get owner references and garbage collection for free. Cool. And then you've got like you know you could have a CI system that's just making etcd cluster objects or whatever app you're trying to model. Yep. I think uh, B two of this presentation will involve building an application that depends on one of these services. Cool, looking forward to that. Thank you so much.